<laughs> all right, friends. I'm so glad you're all here. I'm sure we'll have uh, more people logging on soon. Uh, but <clears throat> Natova again to everybody. I'm so glad you're here. Um, and I'm not at the synagogue, obviously. I could put a fake background on, but um, you get the joy of my um, my office space. Uh, so it's really nice to see you all. And I hope the new year has been treating you well. Uh, why don't we do some quick introductions? Because um, I know all of you, but you don't all know each other. So um, if we could go around and maybe share... A couple of things, your names, where you're dialing in from, and um, what is something in this new year in your own life that you're really looking forward to? It doesn't have to be global, unless you'd like, but something in your own life that you're looking forward to. So who would like to start? Name, location, something you're looking forward to in the new year. My name's Melanie Greenhouse. I'm dialing in from Columbia, Connecticut, just about, oh, 45 minutes from your temple, our temple. And my big goal, this was a question I asked my family at the dinner last night. Um, what is one big thing you wish to accomplish in 5782? <laughs> and my goal is to create a program that uh, that's an intergenerational project between high school students and senior citizens collecting the students would, would be collecting the stories of our senior citizens and creating short narrative poems. Um, so I'm in the midst of contacting high schools and uh, trying to match a couple of students here and there with um, our elders. And then there would be a presentation in the spring via Zoom possibly. So that's my my hope. Cool. Keep us up to date on that, Melanie. Yeah, interesting project. Yeah. Love it. You, are you starting that just locally? And well, Columbia, it started like last high school. It started yeah. last year at Stonykin High School because of contacts I had there, and uh, residents in the local community in that neighborhood. And this year, I think it's going to s expand to East Lyme High School be only because I have a connection. Uh, it. East Lyme, someone on the board of ed is there, and I'm speaking with the superintendent this afternoon. Thank you. And then possibly Ram High School and another high school. So, yay. Oh, Thank you. Great. Okay. Who would like to go next? Name, location, something you're looking forward to in your own life, <laughs> 782. I can call on people. Should I do that? Would that be easier for people? <laughs> <laughs> Sam, how about you? I'll say something. Okay. Uh, my name is Sam Georges. I live in Chester. Uh, I wish everybody Lashana Tova and the best of health and everything else. And uh, I don't know. I think I'm looking forward to a lot of things. But uh, uh, the most major at this time is uh, total recovery from my back surgery. That's what I'm... Amazing. Very I'd be very pleased with that as a start. This Thank you. Um, yes. to in the coming year. We will wish that too. Okay. Um, next, I will, um, Maxine, who just logged on, we're, we're sharing names and locations and something in our personal lives we're looking forward to in 5782. So um, David Belport, why don't you share? Uh, my name is Dave Belport. I am uh, live in Milford, Connecticut. My sister and brother-in-law are, are um, um, congregants at uh, your shul and have come up for high holidays for many, many years. Um, I don't have as lofty of gold as Melanie, but, um, <clears throat> I don't have any children of my own, but I have stepchildren in their twenties and early thirties and two of them have kind of lost their way. And, uh, one is, um, a recovering alcoholic and the other one is got treatment resistant depression. So I just wish them a wonderful year and hopefully that they can step forward in the right direction to, to hopefully, uh, you know, just become happier and um be productive we'll join and feel good about themselves we'll, we'll that's what i wish for thank you for sharing that dave okay rochelle how about you well <clears throat> i'm rochelle dowenheimer and i live in guilford which is a lovely 40 plus mile uh 40 plus a minute ride to the 
show, which I try and do as often as I can. Um, but I love Zoom because it allows me to not only be with you in the summer, but in the winter when I am far, far away. And I love that. Mm -hmm. my, my goals for this year are very simple. I want COVID to go away. <laughs> yeah. Can you hear us? Mm -hmm. We really need that. And we need everybody to step up and do their part. So, yes. yeah. Excellent. Very good. So, Rhea and Daniel, how about you guys? Hello. I'm Daniel and this is Rhea. We're calling in from Boston. Um, do you want to say what you want to do from this? Uh, I'm looking forward to going back to school in person tomorrow for the first time since 2020. Wow. Oh my gosh. Good luck. I'm looking forward to her going back to school. <laughs> <laughs> Good parenting wishes. <laughs> I'm sure there's a whole subtext there. <laughs> Raya, we wish you only the best at school. Um, okay, Susan and Mayor. So I guess I'm the spokesperson for the family. All right. So I think I can say that we're both looking forward to spending more time with our family, um, particularly our three, now three grandchildren. And uh, especially looking forward to having a, what we're hoping to be a normal Thanksgiving and have a baby naming for our youngest granddaughter who's four months old. Oh my goodness. Yes, absolutely. That's wonderful. Thank you. So that, that's the family. That's the, the um, anything more to add, Michael? No, he has nothing more to add. Okay. Well, it was good to see you and the dog yesterday. Um, David Tillis. Oh, I'm David Tillis. I'm calling in from Middletown. Um, my life has changed enormously in the past year. Um, I've suddenly become the family patriarch, <laughs> which is just a really odd thing. Um, and uh, I've retired from work, um, which is also an odd thing. Um, I, uh, I've become the editor of the whole McGill and at first I went into it with, um, some real misgivings, but I'm enjoying it, hoping to make it something creative and informative and engaging of the congregation, um, even people who are scattered geographically. And the other thing is that I've, I've sort of given up on flying out to the West Coast see all of the family that I haven't seen since before the pandemic. So um, probably after the holidays, sometime in October, um, I'm going to drive out to Oregon and see my mother's sister while she's still alive and mm. um, see my sister's best friend from growing up in, uh, near Monterey and sort of do a tour. She's gone for probably about three weeks. We will miss you and wish you yeah, a year. I just don't feel confident flying. So, I mean, not not about the, the flight of the airplane, but. But the people. Pain within the cabin. Yeah. So. I hear you. Thank you, David. Um, and the whole Megillah, for those of you who don't know, is our congregation's newsletter. And it has been um, out of print for um, over a year since our previous editor, Sean Conicky passed away and may his memory be a blessing. And so David has very kindly now um, resurrected the whole Megillah and uh, we hope to have it moving forward. So thank you, David. Um, Maxine. Good morning from Killingworth, Connecticut. <laughs> My twin grandchildren will be 21 in October. They are graduating from college in May. So I look forward to going to those graduations and taking them to Israel as a graduation present if Israel is open to tourists. Oh, that would be so wonderful. And that will happen in June if it happens. Great. How, how Happy wonderful. New Year to all of you. Healthy. Glad you're here, Maxine. Thank you. Arlene. Hi. Hi. I just want you to know that Meg Gister is my cousin. I love her dearly, oh, and I'm so proud of her. 
and I'm happy that she's with you. And I wish I could be with you, but I'm with my congregation in Chester, Connecticut. So I'm going to be going back and forth, I guess. Okay. <laughs> well, please wish um, Rabbi Zimmerman a wonderful Shana Tova from me. No, no, Rabbi Micah. Rabbi Micah Ellenson. Oh, Ellenson, not Zimmerman. Ellenson, I'm sorry. Right, Long right. Rabbinic dynasty. Um, <laughs> Ellenson. Of course, Ellenson. Yeah. Um, David Ellenson, his father ordained me. He put his hands on my kepi. Oh, that's Oof. wonderful. The rabbi and my brother actually. That, so wow, fabulous. Yes, thank you. I did very that. good. Ellenson. Oh my, thank you, Arlene. It's wonderful to thank have you. Here. Um, we have Rick. Are you our grand finale? Did I get to everybody else? I guess I am. Huh? Yeah. Hold on. I'll unmute. Am I unmuted? You are unmuted. Um. I'm Rick Hornung. I'm calling in from Haddam, Connecticut, uh, which is um, uh, perhaps uh, what Haddam is to Chester, what Manasseh and Ephraim are to Israel and the 12 tribes. We're the, we're the brothers on the other side. We didn't want to really cross over the Yidden up here. <laughs> um, and um, thankfully, uh, with, an, with a heart filled with gratitude, we have been able to uh, sidestep um, many, 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 many of the hardships and sufferings imposed and inflicted upon so many of the, in the during this time. And uh, I think I can speak for all of us. We're just very grateful for that. And for me personally, it will be in 5782 when the beloved White Sox, the Pale Hose, will have a post season. And that that's enough for me. Alavai, right? Uh, uh, I remember, I remember when when Sandy Koufax pitched in Comiskey Park in 1959 in the World Series, and how the few Jews on the South Side were very, very split. That was a very, very tough day. He won one to nothing. <laughs> enough out of that. Ask my dad about that. That's awesome. Um, my dad grew up on the south side of Chicago also. So, all right, everybody, thank you for the introductions. Um, for those of you who wonder why we take time to do that, I think um, it's really nice and it's really important, especially in this kind of venue. You know, over the last two days, we had a um, hundred some Zoom boxes on, which was incredible to have such beautiful uh, attendance and people with us and spirits joining together. And the nice thing about this and has always been nice about the second day with CBSRZ is it's always smaller and more intimate. And so we're maintaining that kind of feeling uh, and we really want to get to know each other, especially because we have um, people who are new faces to us and also uh, constituencies within the congregation who may not have met before. So here we are. I'm going to start sharing my screen with uh, the start of our text study, which is going to be the text itself. Uh, hopefully everybody can see it. I am going to, let's see, can I make it just a little bigger? Um, can everybody see it okay? Is the is the size of the text all right for everybody? Mm -hmm. Yep. So we are going to be studying the Akedah. That is the name in Hebrew for the binding of Isaac. This really challenging text that has been assigned to Rosh Hashanah, which is a very strange uh, tradition indeed. And we're supposed to study this text where Abraham is asked by God to take his precious son Isaac up to mount a mountain that God will show him and um, sacrifice him in order to prove that he's, you know, paying attention to God and he's faithful. And that is a really difficult text to study and to understand. Why would that be in there? And and many of us who have studied it before, we 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 have a lot of the background information in our heads about why and what the purpose might be. Uh, but we've been wrestling with it for thousands of years, um, ever since we first started studying it. And so today, after we read through the story itself, we are going to look at a variety of the midrashim, a, a, a variety of the interpretations that the rabbis of old have offered as a way of explaining some of the really tough parts. And some of them 
are very disturbing. Um, instead of trying to gloss over the difficult parts, they actually double down on them and make them even tougher. So we're going to take a look together and discuss. And I don't know how far we'll get. Uh, I'm aiming to be done around 11. Okay, uh, and we'll see how we do. And if we don't finish, I will share the link to the text study page so you can continue reading on your own. I'll share it in the chat box uh, and you'll be able to finish reading uh, together or even as a family, you can study if, or if you have friends who wanna study with you. So um, do we have a reader to read Genesis chapter 22 for us out loud? Thank you. Oh, David, please. Yeah, or at least I'll start it off. And and actually, I, I've just been noticing, like, which of the words have the emphatic trope marks? Nice. And um, like this one here. Yeah, like please, like, take please your son. Please. You know which 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 you know when you actually do the trope, it gets all decorative, and it's like, yep. oh, that changes things a little. Uh, and for um, as a disclaimer, there was a midrash about that, please, that I cut just because there were bigger concepts I wanted to look at. But that is addressed, the fact that the not is there, that God is not just saying, take him, but God is saying, can, can you please? Yeah. And, you know, the next one, Vayikach. Yeah. So that's going to be Vayikach. It's like, yep. you know, like, there's nice. certain, there's, whoever did the trope designations, you know, had a, had a particular thought in mind. Yeah. Anyway, sometime afterward, God put Abraham to the test. He said to him, Abraham, and he answered, here I am. And he said, take your son, your favored one, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the heights that I will point out to you. So early next morning, Abraham saddled his donkey and took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. He split the wood for the burnt offering, and he set out for the place of which God had told him. On the third day, <clears throat> leaving us to wonder what happened on the first day, yeah. Abraham looked up and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his servants, You stay here with the ass. The boy and I will go up there. We will worship, and we will return to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and put it on his son Isaac. He himself took the fire stone. What's, what's the little superscript there? Literally fire. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. He himself took the fire stone and the knife, and the two walked off together. Then Isaac said to his father, Abraham, Father. And he answered, Yes, my son. And he said, Here are the fire stone and the wood. Where is the sheep for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will see to the sheep for his burnt offering. And the two of them walked on together. They arrived at the place of which God had told him. Abraham built an altar there. He laid out the wood. He bound his son. He laid him on the altar, on top of the wood. And Abraham picked up the knife to slay his son. Then an angel of the Lord called to him from heaven. Abraham, Abraham. And he answered, here I am. And he said, do not raise your hand against the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your favored one, from me. When Abraham looked up, his eye fell upon a ram, caught in the thicket by its horns. Oh, okay. All right. Achar or achad. Yeah, yeah. so it's between a Dalit and a Resh. Mm -hmm. So uh, caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering in place of his son. And Abraham named that site Adonai Yireh, God will see. Probably that's what it says. Uh, literally, the Lord will see. Uh -huh. yeah. Whence the present saying, on the mount of the Lord there is vision. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven mm -hmm. and said, By myself I swear. The Lord declares, because you have done this and not have not withheld your son, your favorite one, I will bestow my blessing upon you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars of heaven and the sands on the seashore. 
Your descendants shall seize the gates of their foes. All the nations of the earth shall bless themselves by your descendants, because you have obeyed my command. Abraham then returned to his servants, and they departed together for Beersheba. And Abraham stayed in Beersheba. Sometime later, Abraham was told, Milcah too has borne children to your brother Nahor. Who's the firstborn and who's his brother? Hemuel, the father of Aram, and Chesed, Hazo, Pildash, Yidlaf, and Betuel. Betuel being the father of Rebekah. These eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother. And his concubine, whose name was Reuma, also bore children, Teba, Gaham, Tahash, and Maaka. Thank you. So we just get a little bit of that genealogy at the end, which becomes relevant a little later on, as you see, you know, um, that Bithuel is the father of Rebecca. Um, but really the story ends, I'd say, at, at verse 19, right? Abraham returns to his servants. They departed together for Beersheba, and Abraham stayed in Beersheba. So based on what we just read, and before we turn to the Midrashim, part of what a midrash does, if you haven't had a chance to study them before, is they are written to address questions in the text. And by the way, I'm going to mute everybody, or can you mute yourselves just um, so there's not background noise? Um, please mute yourselves. And we can unmute as we're discussing. Um, so it there are so many inconsistencies and questions and uh, redundancies that come up, missing information in the stories of the Torah. And we as Jews see those and see them as a puzzle waiting to be solved or a question waiting to be answered. And that's actually something that's so beautiful about our tradition, that we really uh, treasure the invitation to, to study the text in this way. So throughout, you know, David Tillis in his reading mentioned a couple of them, you know, like three days later, and all of a sudden we're like, well, Wait a minute, why did you just jump ahead in time? What's been happening all that time? You know, that was one of them. Um, and you also mentioned another question. Um, sorry, let me get back to 22. Um, oh, about Aish, you know, and, and that question of um, what was the translation there. Uh, so we, we have questions about the story. So for those of you who just were listening, were there any questions that popped up in your heads about the story that you want answered? What were, like, if you, you know, what what intrigued you? What surprised you? What troubled you? I have a question, Rabbi. Yes. I only have one child. Those of you who have more than one, God is saying this is his favorite child. Mm-hmm. Are to we presume that you could have a favorite child and why? So that's I want so that's an excellent question and it's actually a mistranslation. Okay, good. I'm really glad you pointed it out. Um the Hebrew, because this is gonna come up, the Hebrew is Yechidcha, your only son. Okay. Take your son, your only son. And so why would they have translated it as favored? That Ooh. is in itself an interpretation. What's wrong with the fact that it says your only son in regards he to Abraham? Had, he had more he had than more. one. Who was his older son? Ishmael, no? Yeah, Ishmael. Yeah. He already had a kid. So the Hebrew is, take please your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. It doesn't just say, hey, take Isaac over to the mountain. It gives all these kind of qualifiers first, you know. Um, you're going to take your son, your only son, your loved son, Isaac. So that's interesting. Why make it so complicated? Yeah, Daniel. I think it's, it's worth pointing out that this passage comes almost directly after, uh, after he sends away Ishmael. Thank you for pointing that out. You want to say more about that? Um, so the, the Torah reading from the previous day, it has a few other things in it, but focuses on, on uh, 
Abraham sending uh, at request of Sarah and with God's command sending away Hagar and Ishmael to what he expects will be their death in the desert. Yes. So. Yes. And there's a question of, um, is Ishmael actually gone? How much time has passed? Is Ishmael part of the journey to Mount Moriah? Uh, but yes, chapter 21, which we studied last year for our text study, uh, especially in relation to uh, Hagar and being the, um, the foreign woman, the um, also Ishmael being the father of Islam. Um, we looked at it through that lens. And so, Daniel, I'm really glad that you contextualized it for us in that way, that Hagar and Ishmael have just been sent away by Sarah. Um, anybody remember why Sarah would be so angry at Hagar and Ishmael? Yeah, Rhea. Because she didn't want Ishmael to get all the intelligence since she was the firstborn son. Yeah, exactly. Um, Sarah had been infertile. She couldn't have a baby. And so she asked her handmaid, um, this is so Handmaid's Tale, okay, asked her handmaid to have a child for her that would count as her child, okay? And Hagar has, you know, is, is very fertile, has a baby, becomes Ishmael, which means God heard me. Uh, and immediately Hagar feels really important uh, and says, you know, I, I had a baby and you didn't. And and Sarah starts to feel really threatened about that. Um, Ishmael also, as Rhea just said, um, is going to be the oldest and get the whole inheritance, or at least the great majority of the inheritance from Abraham. And Sarah doesn't want that either. She wants, because she's the wife, she wants her child who, who you know, um, has just been born finally at the age when she's 90 um, <laughs> um has uh she has a child now so ray does that capture what you said yep th thumbs up thank you so you're absolutely right um so thank you for pointing that out that they've just been sent away okay sarah so she had a baby at 90 after being <laughs> infertile her whole life Okay. And now God is saying, Hey, psst, Abraham, go take that kid and go kill him on top of the mountain. Okay. So what other questions do you have when you read the text? David, I saw you raising your hand. Yeah. You are muted. So I want to go back to uh, the chronology. Go ahead. Um, I mean, the translation is sometime afterward, but it's really after these things. After these things. Yes, good. And if we think about what's happened in the preceding chapter. So, although it's, it's very painful to Abraham, he finally sorts out the intra-family, personal, and dynastic um, tangle that's probably plagued him for more than a decade. Um, it's not a very pleasing solution, but there's a solution. And then he establishes himself in a piece of geography um, with, you know, he, he comes to a treaty with Abimelech, who's the king of the neighboring He's like the chief of the neighboring clan. Mm -hmm. And so he's, you know, he's, he's finally settled. He's finally, okay, he's come to an old age. And, you know, it's though his biography has been written and it's okay. And now God says, mm -hmm. take your son. Yeah. But <clears throat> the, the ambiguity in it is... I can find it. Um, Alehu Sam Laola. Yes. So, you know, we don't find out until Leviticus what an Ola actually is. That's true. 
It's and a yeah, that is not used yet. So Watch. I think Noah may no. I think it, Noah might also offer up an Ola. Okay, maybe I don't know. I'll have to look at that when we're talking. But you know, it's it's like raise him there as a as a rising. I mean, if you want to be really literal about it, um, you know, we know that later on that word is used for a fire that consumes the bull or the sheep or the whatever. Yep. I, I think it has to be ambiguous here. And part of the test for Abraham is, so what are you going to make of this instruction? Mm. You know, it doesn't actually tell him to slaughter the kid. It doesn't doesn't tell him to go through all the procedure that you would do for a Levitical Ola. Mm -hmm. You wash it and you separate the limbs and the whatever. Um, and then later on, he's going to tie him to the wood. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, think about that. You just roll right off a bunch of sticks. <laughs> We're going to address that, actually. One of the Midrashim addresses that. So there's this built-in ambiguity right at the beginning. Yep. Of what is an Ola. Yeah, and, and and how would Abraham interpret? Sure. You're right. That is a fair question. Is did Abraham actually know what an Ola is? What you know, which here is translated as burnt offering, right? Um it's related to the word aliyah, aliyah, um, which is to go up to bless the Torah, right? That's an aliyah. Also, moving to Israel is viewed as a rising up spiritually, and that's why you make aliyah to Israel. So it's all that same root word. It's something that goes up. And so if you think of the fact that a, a sacrifice goes up to God in some way, uh, the the smell, you know, God it says over and over in the text that God loves the reach nichoach, the delicious smell of, um, of the sacrifices, you know, good barbecue smells good. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, so it's something that raises up and connects to God and it's a communication to God usually of some kind. And we'll have differentiations, especially in the book of Leviticus of the different kinds of sacrifices, but the Ola is one of the most common. So it is a, it is a really interesting point here of an anachronism. If you're following the chronology of the Torah as it is that Ola Abraham wouldn't necessarily know what an Ola is. Um, similarly, in the book of Noah, uh, or the story of Noah, there's the part where it says, take two of every animal and put them on the boat. And then right after it says, take seven of the pure animals and take two of the impure animals. That's another anachronism. We don't yet have the differentiation of what's a pure animal or a kosher animal, and what's a not kosher animal. And so interesting that um, the rabbis, instead of saying, maybe maybe this wasn't written chronologically, um, the rabbis just excuse it by saying, and you know, those of you who come to scrollers have heard me say this a hundred times, ein mukdam ve'en me'uchar batorah. There is no before and after in the Torah. The, you don't have to worry about the chronology. It just all kind of happens at the same time. And that history, the history is not what's important or the chronology is not what's important. Instead, it's the teachings. So, um, but it's a fair, not, and it's a fair criticism of the text. How does Abraham know what an Ola is? So thank you, David Tillis. Um, let's take one more. Any other questions that came up for you with the text? Yeah, Rochelle. I admit to being very ignorant of all of the discussion, but I have a question. Please. What is Isaac thinking? Yes. Yes. Huge question. Rochelle, that is an that is an enormous question, and that is something we are going to talk to look at in the Midrashim because the rabbis wanted to know that too. Isaac has says nothing, right? Except um, hey, Dad, um, I, I see the wood, I see the fire stone, you know, like a flint that's going to light the wood, but, um, where's the sheep? <laughs> um, you know, so he's, you can see the gears are turning in Isaac's head of like, there's something missing here. And what's interesting in the Hebrew is it says, um, Vayomer Yitzchak el Abraham, so Isaac said to Abraham, Aviv? you know, um, to his dad, his, um, 
oh, his Vayomer Avi. Hey, Dad, um, and Vayomer Hine Bani, and and Abraham says, okay, yes, I'm here, my son. Vayomer Hine Haesh Vahaitzim Vaaye Hasela Ola. So so Isaac says, you know, I see the firewood and the tree, the wood, and where is the sheep for the offering? And Abraham says, Vayomer Avraham Elohim Yer Elo Hase Le Ola Bini. Okay, so how do we translate? What's this period here? God will see to the sheep for his burnt offering, my son. Is it a comma or is it a colon? Right, Rochelle. If it was a colon, yes, he's just but, giving him away. But the but the other thing is that I mean the son just allows himself to be put on the wood mm -hmm. to be offered. Yes. So you are not ignorant of this. You are asking one of the biggest questions is what the heck is going on with Isaac? Um, and that also leads to the question of how old is Isaac when all of this is going on? Is he a child? Do we picture him as a child? Is he an adult? Right? It's unclear. And there are midrashim that we're going to take a look at that say he's an adult when all of this is going on. Okay. Um, so uh, that was a great question. So now let's take a look together at the Midrashim. Uh, I am actually, no, this list looks okay to look at it this way. So what existed before creation? I'm going to take you through a couple Midrashim that set things up. And so stay with me. If everybody can just mute, I'm going to kind of build up to where we're going with this. The rabbis, um, sorry, I'm trying to move my mic. Um, just to get a sense of how they thought, they loved playing with the ideas of things that were missing in the text. And one of the things they created was an idea of before creation, before that beret sheet at the beginning of Torah, what existed. Okay. So they say there were seven things, seven being one of these, you know, magical numbers that appears a lot in the text. Seven things were created before the world was created. Okay. So what was created before creation? Okay. Interesting. They are Torah. Torah, the whole Torah exists before creation. Gehinom. Gehinom. Anybody want to define Gehinom? The netherworld. Thank you, Rick. The netherworld. Uh, um, or hell. Really, um, Sheol is another world that has no judgment. Gehinom is hell. Okay. Um, based on the fact that it's named after a valley in Jerusalem, right near the Jaffa Gate, where apparently there were pagan sacrifices of children. Okay. So our idea of Gehinom, of what could hell be like, is likened to this place where our ancestors witnessed child sacrifices all the time. So you might be seeing why I feel this is relevant, okay? Um, that our idea, that this is our idea of hell, is a place where child sacrifice happens. Um, and, and for those of you who, you know, say Jews don't believe in hell, yeah, we do. Um, the Garden of Eden is both believed to be... Um, the Garden of Eden that was in Genesis. It's also believed to be heaven, and it's believed to be Olam Haba, the, the world to come of whatever this messianic age will be, what it will look like in the future. The throne of glory, that's God's throne. That's where God sits, you know, hangs out, plays video games, I guess. Um, the temple, the temple, capital T, in Jerusalem. So the concept of a temple in Jerusalem is already created before creation. Repentance, teshuvah, is in existence before creation. I love that. That we have the opportunity for second chances before we're even created. It's beautiful. And the name of the Messiah, okay, which um, God knows and created. So there is a Messiah in God's thoughts before creation, okay? So interesting that we already have before creation this concept of Gehinom. Then the rabbis created a list of 
what was created at the very, very end of the sixth day. Okay, so we had now the six days of creation. Doop -doop 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 -doop. And at the very end, what were the last things on God's checkoff list that needed to be created before God was going to rest before Shabbat? Okay, and what's interesting is there are things that are set in motion for the future that are like in place waiting for their cue, if we think theatrically for a minute. Okay, so this, oh, and I just wanted to say, Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, because a bunch of our texts are going to come from there today, is a midrashic text that is composed um, in Talmudic Israel and Babylon between 630 and 1030 CE. Okay, so it spans 400 years, the texts that are included, but just to get a sense of where they come from, where this text comes from. Okay. Um, it was likely edited in the 8th or 9th century. Okay. So then we have a text from the Talmud itself. Okay, and I just want to show you. So now 450 to 550, something earlier. So here's the, here's the 10 things. 10 miraculous phenomena were created in heaven on Shabbat Eve during twilight and were revealed in the world only later. Only later? Question mark? I don't know why it's a question mark. They were Miriam's well. They give that well to Miriam, that it's her uh, way of keeping the Israelites hydrated as they wander through the wilderness. And of course, it disappears when she dies. And that's one of the reasons we associate Miriam with water. The manna that fell in the desert. So the food that fed us through our wandering. The rainbow. What's the rainbow? Which specific rainbow is it talking about? This might be obvious, but just to say it. After the flood, the covenant. Yes, beautiful. Thank you. Exactly. After the flood. Um, the promise that God would never do that again. Uh, writing and writing instruments. So giving us literacy and the ability to write things down is really important. The tablets of the Ten Commandments. So those stones are waiting for us. Okay. And the grave of Moses. So where is Moses going to be buried? So this is all. So the sixth day of creation. All of this already exists. It's just waiting. Moses isn't even alive yet. It's going to be, you know, a very long time, but it exists. And the cave in which Moses and Elijah stood, um, that's the cave, I believe, where he, you know, takes off his sandals and is on holy ground. Um, the opening of the mouth of, of mouth of Balaam's donkey. So what's that? Who remembers that? What's the story of Balaam's donkey opening its mouth? Susan, are you raising your hand? No? Sort of. I was. I, I, have, cause I, don't, I don't remember all the details, but it was blocking the way of um, uh, um, Balak. Is it, Balak was the one that was um, sent to destroy the uh, Israelites. But Balaam was the king who sent Balaam. Yes, and their names are so familiar, so it's really confusing. They're so simi similar. Yeah, which one is which, Rabbi? Balak is the king. Yeah. Balaam is the one who is sent to go and curse the Israelites. But it's right, oh, so Balak is the bad guy, and Balaam ends up being um, <laughs> praising. Yeah, okay. So the fact that his donkey is going to talk to him, you know, um and sing and wind up in the shrek movies um is set from the sixth day of creation um the opening of the earth's mouth to swallow the wicked in the incident involving korach so at, so korach's rebellion is already set in motion um korach and datan and aviram and the fact that they are going to be swallowed up by the earth as punishment that place is already set I mean, it's just fascinating that rabbis believed that, you know, these things are all waiting for, it's like a predestination kind of thing. Is there actually free will? Okay. So then Rabbi Nehemiah said in the name of his father, even the fire and the mule, which is a product of crossbreeding. So the fact that fire exists and a mule. So we're going to be so smart that we're going to have a horse and a donkey mate and have a mule. Um, and then Rabbi Yoshia said in the name of his father, even the ram slaughtered by Abraham in place of Isaac. So the rabbis believed that the ram, 
that's going to take the place of Isaac at the slaughter, at the, at the sacrifice, um, is waiting. So God never intended, interesting, to have Isaac be sacrificed, that they make that clear. The ram is waiting. Abraham has to go through the process. What a horrible process. But the ram is waiting then to take Isaac's place. Uh, it's, a, it's an important, I guess, theological point to make that we can't imagine a God who would really actually expect Abraham to sacrifice his son. Um, and then the other just neat thing where, is the tongs. Um, God is called the ultimate tong maker because in order to make tongs, you need tongs. So in order to hold tongs in the fire to make them, you need tongs to hold them in the fire. So like, where did that first set of tongs come from? And so the rabbi said, um, that first set of tongs was also created <laughs> at the end of the sixth day because we needed a pair of tongs to make tongs. Um, okay, so then we come to the point of why did God do this to Abraham? Why? Do you ever wonder that? Like, what kind of God would do this? Um, Maxine, do, are you wanting to say something? You're you're muted though. Nope, still muted. Hold on. Let me. If I click that, are you able to do that? Zoom doesn't let us unmute people anymore. Mute. There you can go. Can you hear me? Now we can. I'm just trying to make it larger on my iPad screen and it's not happening. So I can actually read it. Go oh. ahead. Don't bother with me. Oh, all right. But I will always bother with you um, because I adore you. All right. So, you know, what we have this idea even now, which let me just say from the start, I don't believe this is how the world works, that God tests us and only tests those who can, you know, serve, you know, God will only give you as much as you can handle. Um, that's a theology that is a way of coping with the fact that life gets really, really hard sometimes. And like, you should feel, um, you should feel honored that God has made your life hell. Okay. <laughs> you know, um, because it means you're great. And so we get three texts here that say Abraham is so wonderful and that's why God tests him so much. So um, can we have a reader for these three short texts? Susan, are you raising your hand? Yes, I am. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to be so tentative today. Yeah, it's okay. Are you, you don't have Rabbi, to. You know, the other thing that occurred, I just, if I may just take this minute to, co to comment that the things that were created, the 10 things that were created before the, or after the sixth day, um, I mean, it gives, it, um, it makes me think uh, that, you know, maybe time is really flat. And, you know, that wonderful quote from uh, Albert Einstein, I, you know, you may have heard me say this before, that the quote is that the past, present, and future are all an illusion, however persistent. You know, that everything that is, is happening has already happened or it's, you know, the future has happened. And um, so that's how those 10 things uh, could have been created <laughs> after the sixth day. But anyway, I, I will read. Yeah, thank you. Because it's a really, it's a fascinating idea that they came up with. And it is, it is kind of like that, where it's saying, you know, these things are already in motion. They've, or they've already happened. You know, God knows they will happen. Um, so... So this one, starting with Midrash Tanhuma. Tanhuma. Um, and you'll see it's a, between 500 and 800 CE, uh, a major Midrash on the five books of Torah. Okay. Structured as sermons. Okay. So, so and this is Vayera from Vayera 21. Uh -huh. And God did prove Abraham. Scripture okay. states elsewhere in allusion to this verse, the Lord trieth the righteous. Uh, Rabbi Jonah maintained, if you pound a good quality flax, its quality will improve. But if you pound a poor quality flax, 
it will crumble. So the Holy One, blessed be he, tests only the righteous. Okay, go ahead to the next one. It's another metaphor. And Rabbi Judah, the son of Shalom, said, a potter never tests a defective vessel for fear that it might break while being tested, but he always tests a perfect one. Likewise, the Holy One, blessed be he, tests the righteous, but not the wicked. As it is said, the Lord trieth the righteous. Okay, and one more. And Midrash Tanhuma Vayera 23, Rabbi Eliezer declared, if a householder has two cows, one of which is strong and the other is weak. He places the yoke on the stronger cow and not on the weaker one. Hence, scripture says, the Lord trieth the righteous and God did prove Abraham. Yeah, the prove is the test. Um, yeah. Not Abraham to prove, but prove is being used where we usually put the word test. God did test Abraham. Right. So um, thank you for reading those three, Susan. So um, what do you think about those ideas? I'd love to hear if there's somebody who hasn't spoken yet or um, not as much. You know, I'd love to hear from you. Rick, did you want to chime in? Uh, no, but I, I, <laughs> I speak too much. Uh, sure do. Uh, we'll just say there sure. you go. <laughs> there you go. I have enough to say now. <laughs> no, go ahead. Go ahead. No, that's okay. Okay. All right. I'll, I can come back to you. So, please do. Has a a thought on this? Do you do you believe in this? Have you seen this in your life? Do you object to it? I mean, I told you I object to it, but you don't have to object to it. Um, what do you think about this? Yeah, Melanie, do you want to say something? <clears throat> well, the thought is not fully formed, but I think it it omits a whole sector of the population that, you know, not everyone can be as righteous. And does that eliminate uh, everyone else? That's interesting. Are you saying that is God not in relationship with them then? Well, if, if God is only testing uh, the righteous um, and the strong, yeah. you know, uh, <laughs> then the, their whole uh, swaths of the population that, that don't fit into that category. Um, that's true. Well, I, and I would say yay for them. They don't get these tests of having to sacrifice their kids. You know, it makes being righteous not such a great thing. Um, at least, you know, I mean, like, if you really, like, think about it. Um, but it's saying, like, if you go through these terrible tests in your life, it means you're righteous. And that's, a, that's a, for me, that's a really troubling theology. Mm. Um, you know, the more sorrow that, that you go through. And the, the Akedah is seen as Abraham's 10th test. I didn't give you that um text here, but you can Google it, Abraham's 10 tests, and you'll see the list of what the rabbis consider. Um, and this is the 10th and final. Uh, so, you know, Abraham's been through a lot. By the, the same way, happened with uh, Job as well, right? Yes. yes. And there are links that the texts make between Abraham and um, Job. Um, I, we had, a, by the way, a sketch in my sketch comedy troupe in college where it was actually um, Abraham's nephew, Lot, who was, you know, standing off to the side going, Abraham, go ahead and sacrifice your son. And it was just playing a prank on him. Um, so um, so um, Susan Peck has a hand up. Hey, uh, hey Rabbi. Hey. Um, good morning. Good morning. Good yontif. So uh, am I conflating you with another rabbi or did I... <laughs> Did I hear you speak once? At a, I think it was a sermon. I, I have a memory of it being in in um, a full congregation, where you use the expression "veil of tears." V a l e. 
veil of tears. Was that you? I don't know. I don't think so. Are you, are you familiar with the expression, Rabbi? Not sure. So it, it, as I understand it, it's uh, some dispute whether or not we invented it or the uh, non-Jew invented it. But the idea that we have to go through this, this valley of tears to get to the other side. That's, in, that, in my estimation, that's the thread of those, um, those three midrash. Yes. And, and then, then yeah, no, I'm sorry. Ahead, and then back to the beginning when you, when you lopped off um, you know, the children at the end of the Akedah, I, I really think that's an important uh, issue because I, I think text or I think text is taking us back to Rebecca. I, I think it's important that not only forward to Rebecca, that, yeah, yeah, that we have to know that she's alive and she's at this point, you know, on the earth. Yes, yes, Isaac's true love. Yes, um, and he will meet her. So you're right. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, so what what I hear you saying is there is suffering that we go through that i feel is different than saying god is making us suffer good, good. thank you rabbi um so i um i see them as different theological statements because one is recognizing that everybody's going to suffer and maybe god is with us in that suffering giving us strength rather than causing it um, I, I, I don't know if that's, that's what you're alluding to. If, um, I, it, well, thank you for trying. I mean, my, my unlocking device was the cleft in the rock. I, it, I, I just don't, I just don't think the divinity, when, when the divinity jumps into our history, um, you know, they're, they're few and far between and, and they, they are by definition inexplicable. And then this is one where it's not only inexplicable, it, it actually, uh, it frightens you, it trembles, it makes you tremble. And, and perhaps that's where the, the, the from, you know, get, get the notion that they have to tremble before God. Yes. Yeah. I mean, what's the difference between the word sacred and the word scared? Oh yeah, you're right. Same letters. You're right. Thank you. Yeah, David. You're welcome. So, you have to be especially thick-headed not to notice that life throws choices at you. Um, whether you call those tests or not, I don't know. But, you know, clearly it isn't just the, the exceptionally righteous who have to make difficult choices throughout their lives. And perhaps the better the better thought is not Job, but Jonah. Mm. Because there's nothing exceptional about Jonah. Huh? Um, except that he's fairly good at running away. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, the question then is, we know that God does not want Abraham to Isaac. Yes, we as the reader. Okay. We as the reader. And of course, we know how the stories can come out. Because it's only like 20 verses and you can flip the page and see the end. Oh, look. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Yep. But, you know, Abraham doesn't know and neither does Isaac. Um, yeah, and I want to make and, sure some of those. Yeah. You know, so kind of going back to where I was before. You know, here Abraham has made some really difficult choices. He's been tested, as you say, nine times or however many times. Um, and he's, he's sometimes really played the game with high stakes and high risks. You know, he, he leaves his wife in the house of the Pharaoh. And, and you know, I mean, this is, this is a fairly dire story yeah. for this man who, what, you know, he doesn't have a PhD in risk taking. We don't know anything about his training before God I mean, says go. Yeah. Um. 
Yeah. He just goes yeah. from this yeah. new God that he, that nobody knows about. And he's like, okay. <laughs> Brandon. So, you know, as a model, you know, let's, let's assume that whoever wrote these stories could have written about lots of people. We could have told his whole biography of Lot. Right. Um, so, you know, but we get him in just a couple of little brush strokes. So as, as a model, you know, it's almost like there's a three-way test going on here. You know, you almost get the sense that, that Abraham is testing God. Mm -hmm. well, let's see how far you play this game. Because, you know, I'm getting a little tired of all these choices you're throwing at me. But yep. Let's see how far you can push this. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, that's something that I've wrestled with, too. I think I spoke about it in one of my sermons in the last couple of years, um, not to, you know, that I'm, I'm agreeing with you that Abraham wants to know how far this God is going to go. Yeah. I mean, well, you can he's, he's lifted up the knife. Yeah. And, you know, it doesn't say he brings the knife down. It's like, okay, just, now, are you happy now? Right. <laughs> now what do you want to do? <laughs> exactly. It doesn't, we don't know how long he held the knife up and he's just, yeah. Waiting. Um, so thank you. Yes. Um, Rick, should I call on you now? It's okay. This I really Maxine don't have much to help. say. Go ahead. Oh, Max, please, Maxine, please. Yeah, I'm thinking and maybe then, God is also testing Isaac. Isaac, if he's old enough to know the difference, yes. has to have faith in his father, who in turn is having faith in God. Nice. So it's a test for Isaac as well. Yes. Good. I want to get to those midrashim. You're absolutely right. Um, that is such a good comment is like what how is isaac involved you know so rick last call you're okay okay <laughs> all right so um so we had this question of the fact that there are two sons and so the rabbis imagine an actual conversation going on that we are not privy to or that was maybe excised from the text in their imagination um so, Maxine, can you read this? Do you mind? Are you able to see it? Oh, I just remember you said you couldn't zoom in enough. So you don't have to. What am I reading? Midrash 22-2? Um, yep. Okay. The cataract lenses and the iPad. Hello. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son. Abraham asked, which son is that? The Holy One replied, your only son. But he said, one of my sons is the only son of his mother, and the other is the only son of his mother. The son you love, he replied. I love them both, Abraham responded. The one you love the most, said God. Is there a limit in the viscera? Is there a measure within which a man gauges the love he bears his sons, he asked? Forthwith, God replied, Isaac. Mm -hmm. So, so what are we getting? There? Isaac was God's favorite. I'm thinking. Great interpretation. What does this conversation add to the story? I know a bunch of you are writers. So what what did this just do to the narrative? Remember the text itself, if we go back, all that happens is God says, take your son, your only son. Oh, wait, take now your son, your only son, the one you love, Isaac. Okay, I'm going from the Hebrew because that's the order that's important. Um, the translation doesn't do that. So we're now, what is this doing to that? Okay, Susan. So I hope this thought that I'm having is not true, but uh, I mean, I, I wonder if this is um, the result of editing, by, you know, the redactors of of the Torah, the only, the one you love, um, favoring, you know, I, I mean, where did this come from that God favored, we to believe that God favored the, um, you know, looking ahead that God knew maybe, you know, that God knew that Ishmael would be, he did because it's in the Torah, it's in this Parsha that he would also become the patriarch of a great nation, Ishmael. Right. Um, but not ours. God favored uh, Isaac's nation, the Jewish people, over Ishmael's. 
nation. Yep. So that's is that what we're, I mean, that's a very troubling thought right from the get-go. <laughs> yeah, if, if you're troubled by um, chosenness, right? Um, which, which many of us are, uh, many of us are not. Uh, but we know that the narrative has to happen in a particular way, that it has to go Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, uh, Moses, right? And we have to get all the way through those generations and it's going to go through Isaac. Um, so yes, Ishmael is going to be the patriarch of his own enormous people. If it's written retrospectively, it's saying, we know that there's going to be this other people who we are in some kind of relationship with. Let's make them brothers. Let's make our people's brothers in our myth. Okay? Because then at least there's a part of the story where we are, we are connected. And of course, look at all the, the discussion groups, the interfaith discussion groups now that call us children of Abraham. Right? And it's a way of saying Christians, Muslims, and Jews all come from the same place. So the story's written that way. Um, so Susan, you're you're right in that. Um, the Torah is saying that Isaac is the favorite. Note that the Quran changes this to Ishmael. Ishmael is the one who is sac almost sacrificed on the mountain. Same story, but it's Ishmael. Um, so, right, we have to change who the favorite son is. Um, yeah, we can be. That's part of what we're uncomfortable with here. If you really like look at that. So thank you. Um, what any, any other thoughts about what this conversation does by adding in Abraham's thoughts or responses to God, making it a conversation instead of a, just a command? Rabbi? Rick? Um, I... Uh... Uh, the one purpose of Midrash is, as you point out, to fill in the blanks and therefore make, um, give us the opportunity to see that which is not revealed in the text about our, about the men and women we read about who are sacred or however we want to choose them. So certainly this gives, this Midrash gives us a chance to consider the possibility that Abraham, as he does later, or as he had done before, excuse me, has no problem arguing or speaking to the divine that commands him. That's number one. Number two, I think that uh, this Midrash highlights something that you picked up on, which I, which I think is really important, and I'm glad you mentioned it, that perhaps one of our extra biblical visions of hell or the netherworld is a world in which there is child sacrifice. Yes, absolutely. And this midrash in particular, not only does it show us Abraham willing to confront the divine as he did over Sodom and Gomorrah, it also once again shows his real, you mean I have to now participate in child sacrifice? That I think is really the subtext of of this. You mean, I now have to become a pagan? I mean, how much more do I have to do? I think is really the, if I were, if I were the, the, the scrivener writing this script, that would certainly be one of the emotions, or the director of the play, that would be one of the emotions that I would want Abraham to somehow convey to the audience. I mean, how much more do I have to do? I've already given up one. Now you're asking me to give up a second. And, um, and given how one whole strand of the three Abrahamic religions, really the one central event of that religion is a child sacrifice. Um, it's a really important uh, question to focus on. And I think that uh, the rabbis who certainly who wrote this midrash at the time, they were uh, in a situation where they may have felt suppressed, oppressed, uh, assimilated or whatever by a religion that does put child sacrifice in the middle of its theology or theophany. And we don't. And I think that's really important part to, to see. 
And the child sacrifice, just to be specific, is a God um, having Jesus be killed on the cross. Yes? That's right. That's right. That's right. The child sacrifice is, okay, I won't ask you to do this, but I will take my son who will stand, who will stop. I'm the son who does that. And, yeah. you know, there's a, there's a great strand of, of Jewish, of 20th century Jewish scholarship, John Levinson's book, uh, that, you know, goes all the way through from the Akedah to... Yes. Um, and, and, you know, that, you know, that, that, you know, the crucifixion is in fact, uh, a, a riff on this idea. Yes. So the completion of it, right? Yeah, well, that's what Levinson would say, right? Um, <laughs> and why is Jesus a lamb? You know, I mean, right, of course it's, it's, it's lamb, all right. And you have the idea that there's no sheep. Where's the sheep? Right. right. And, sheep so, and, and of course that this happens at Passover and the lamb. I mean, it's all. It's all linked. Thank you. It, okay. Um, David, I'm going to ask you to hold on because I just want to keep going just a little bit. Um, the other, so uh, just to, to go in deeper in one thing that Rick said is we can't imagine a parent not arguing with this command. We just can't imagine it. And the fact that Abraham says nothing, but actually wakes up early the next morning to go through with this. When Abraham had fought with God about Sodom and Gomorrah a little bit earlier and said, how can you wipe out these towns? What if there are righteous people there? So we know Abraham to fight with God. That's part, I'm just filling in part of what, you know, has been said. Um, for those of you who might, who might not be as familiar with the text, we know Abraham has no problem arguing with God over something he thinks is unfair. Why does Abraham say nothing here? It, so this Midrash tries to humanize him instead of making it this really confusing, um, okay, I'll wake up the next morning, let's go. No, that's how I deal with Disneyland. You know, that's not how I deal with killing a kid. Um, so he wakes up the next morning early. So how did Abraham feel about this command from God to sacrifice his beloved son? Okay, so some more of the texts... Um, deal with that question. We have this one from Midrash Tanhuma, which says how many, you know, it, the text itself says he wakes up the next morning and he saddles his, his own ass, right? His own donkey. And he splits the wood and he sets out and they ask, you know, we know Abraham has servants. Why is he doing it himself? And the Midrash says, yet he saddled the ass himself. This reveals his eagerness to fulfill God's command. So the rabbis in this one, you know, you have you have rabbis with different opinions. Um, you had the ones who said he couldn't have just gone ahead with it. And then you have the ones who say, no, look at this man of faith and righteousness who just can't wait to fulfill God's command. And, you know, there are there are polemics and teachings behind all of these assumptions um, that the rabbis want to get forth, you know, want to make sure you get. So, you know, from this, we're supposed to say, no matter what the mitzvah is, we're supposed to go through it and fulfill it with eagerness. Okay. The next one uh, we see in real life all the time, even now, another comment on early in the morning, righteous men are always anxious to fulfill their religious duties as early as possible. For example, though scripture states, and on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised thereby indicating that the entire day is appropriate for circumcision, a righteous man will fulfill the precept of circumcision as early in the day as possible. And you might know in your own experience that a bris usually takes place in the morning. And there's something that always feels a little weird if it takes place later in the day, right? It's usually around in the morning and you have brunch. Um, and it comes from this teaching. This is a halakha. This becomes law that, not law, but pretty enduring custom that a bris should take place in the morning because we are so excited and eager to fulfill this commandment of um, adjusting the shape of our son's penises. Um, Susan, what would you, oh, wait, wait. So David, you were first. No, no, no go ahead. Didn't. I'll pass. Um, Susan, briefly, because um, we don't have a lot. Yeah, of so I just wanted to comment, Rabbi, uh, um, uh, about the last thing, because I noticed that the text actually says it doesn't say your only son. It says the one you love. I mean, it looks like, I mean, I don't know a lot of Hebrew, but I know that the Hebrew says love and doesn't say your only son. 
It's right. a hafta right there. I share a hafta. I love them both. What do you mean? You know, you're telling me I'm supposed to only love one of my kids. I love both my kids. Doesn't matter that they come from different mothers. They're my kids. So yeah, Susan, thank you for pointing that out. Um, that God is saying something here to, to Abraham that at least the rabbis point out um, doesn't make any sense or shouldn't, shouldn't make sense. Um, okay, so we have the question of why on the third day or not the first or the second day? Um, this is interesting, just a little bit of psychology that they enter in here. Um, on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. And, and David Tillis, when he was reading it, said, wait a minute, where, what happened the other days? Why was he able to see the place on the third day, but not on the first or second day? Lest the inhabitants of the world assert that he was still in shock from God's command and therefore was willing to sacrifice his son. So what are they saying here? By making it the third day. Yeah, Rochelle. They were giving him time to reconsider. Secular. Yep. Or so, he was possibly trying to process where? the command. The knife on the edge of the yep. Yep. floor. And so he has. Oh, wait, uh, okay. well, I'm just going to mute the pecs, okay? Um, so. He was clear-headed by day three. But the problem is, how could he say no? How could he say no? I mean, suppose on day one he says that he's, he gets up early in the morning. Suppose when he hears the command, yep. he's, he's thinking to himself, this is absurd. Yep. How could he say no? Right? It's almost like the next morning he gets up and he, he's, he's, it's almost like he's being defiant. You want me to do this? Okay, I'll saddle my ass. Let's get yeah. the wood. We'll we'll see, you know, who backs down first. Yeah, we're gonna play. Kinda, yeah, <laughs> how could he possibly say no? Yes, you're right, okay. um, Rabbi. Rick. Um, I, I think uh, we're descending into the um, more uh, earnest um, possibilities when perhaps there's a comic possibility. Oh, and that is, and, and, and just, I mean, you know, why not always go to the Shecky Green School of Midrash instead of the, or the <laughs> Buddy Hackett, right? I mean, just as, just as uh, Moses made a 40 year trip out of something that could be done in 11 days, you know, Abraham, I mean, he kind of stumbles around. He doesn't know his way. And finally, on the third day, he kind of sees this is the first, this is the first Jew who has no sense of direction. And first in many Jews who has no sense of direction. That's how I read it, but so, what do I know? So what so God should have sent him a you know Rand McNally wrote out. Oh that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's assuming that Abraham can read a map. I mean, <laughs> that's how I yep, yep. So yeah, maybe he couldn't get there. You can find it. I uh, no, couldn't find it. And, and what is he going to ask somebody? What is he going to ask Sarah for help? <laughs> How do I get to the place I'm going to kill your son? I, you can't do that, right? I mean, you know, it's yeah. just. And that's yeah. the next section we're going to get to is what about Sarah? Okay, so yeah, David. Well, let's, no, let's go on to Sarah. Let, let, okay, let's go on to Sarah. Yeah. Um, so uh, what about Sarah? Where is she in all of this? She's the mother of this kid. She laughed when God and the angels told her she was going to actually conceive at the age of 90. And so her son is named Yitzchak, which means he shall laugh. Um, and uh, she finally has a kid. And for any of us who have experienced infertility, and I'm included in that, the idea that your husband would sneak off to go sacrifice his son to this God that only he can hear is pretty wacko. Okay. So what does Sarah think about this? And he saw the place from afar off. Abraham had asked himself, what shall I do? If I tell Sarah all about it, consider what may happen. After all, a woman's mind becomes distraught over insignificant matters. How much more disturbed would she become if she heard something as shocking as this? However, if I tell her nothing at all and simply steal him away from her when she's not looking, she'll kill herself. What, would do, what did he do? 
He said to Sarah, prepare some food and drink that we may eat and rejoice. Well, why is this day different from other days? Manishtana, she asked. What are you celebrating? He replied, when a couple our age has a son, it is fitting indeed that they should eat, drink, and rejoice. Whereupon she prepared the food. While they were eating, he said to her, when I was a child of three, I already knew my creator, yet this child is growing up and still has no instruction. There is a place a short distance away where children are being taught. I will take him there. And she said, go in peace. Um, yeah, this is just further evidence of why our rabbis are sometimes not worthy of the word sage. Many times they are. But this is, yeah, you know, oh, that's a good idea. He lied, <laughs> which, you know, this will work. <laughs> this'll work, you know. I mean, you know, husbands do this for, you know, that, that Abraham is a husband and lies. Yes. Yeah. But. Yeah, let's make him into a liar. Yeah. Yeah, Melanie, are you? I, I'm just thinking this is the the impulse to, to offer backstory. Um, it goes on in modern literature as well. For instance, the the Wizard of Oz gave rise to Wicked, which explained the whole origin yeah. of why why things happened the way they did. So this was is just a flight of imagination. Yeah. Exactly. Um, a lot of people call it fan fiction now. Midrash is fan fiction, you know, yeah. filling in gaps or creating new stories within the stories. And rabbis have been doing it for 2000 years. Um, and here, just another one about Sarah. Why did he why did he wake up so early in the morning? Because he had said to himself, perhaps Sarah will change her mind and not let me go. I've got to get up early before she changes her mind. OK. Oof. So then, as if things weren't complicated enough. Satan enters the story, okay? Um, Satan in Jewish tradition is not the devil um, equivalent to God, right? Satan is instead one of the angelic court, a member of the angelic court, who happens to be an antagonizer, okay? An, an antagonist. Um, and loves to just push and push all of God's buttons, okay? And... Um, he is inserted into a number of the midrashim to explain ones that that you know, stories that just don't make sense, and it, it it does make sense in the rabbinic mind that Satan had to be involved here, because why would God do this? So here's another way of explaining it. So Melanie, like what you said about creating backstory, we're going to now introduce an antagonist who's going to make some of these narrative plot points happen. Um, Melanie, do you want to read? Uh, Midrash Tanhuma Vaira 22.10. Satan appeared before him on the road in the guise of an old man and asked, whither are you going? Abraham replied, to pray. And why, Satan retorted, does one go to pray carry fire and a knife in his hands and wood on his shoulders? We may tarry there for several days, said Abraham, and slaughter an animal and cook it. The old man responded, that is not so. I was present when the Holy One, blessed be he, ordered you to take your son. Why would an old man who begets a son at the age, uh -oh, at the age of a hundred destroy him? Have you not heard the parable of the man who destroyed his own possessions and then was forced to beg from others? If you believe that you will have another son, you are listening to the words of a seducer. And furthermore, if you destroy a soul, you will be held legally accountable for it. Abraham answered, it was not a seducer, but the Holy One, blessed be he, who told me what I must do, and I shall not listen to you. Okay, interesting. So Satan <laughs> tries, to, tries to dissuade Abraham from listening to God's commandment. Okay, so now Satan is going to go on. Okay, um, who hasn't read, who might want to read? Sam, you want to read? You're muted, so I don't know if you're saying yes or no.
Still can't hear you. Sorry. Nope. All right, we'll try to get you on the next one, okay? Okay. Um, Michael Pearl, do you want to read? Oh, okay, I'm going to read. All right. So Satan departed from him, from Abraham, and appeared at Isaac's right hand in the guise of a youth. He inquired, where are you going? To study the law, Isaac replied. Alive or dead? He retorted. Is it possible for a man to learn the law after he is dead? Isaac queried. Oh, sorry, that was Isaac speaking. Is it possible for a man to learn law after he said? And he said to him, oh, unfortunate son of an unhappy mother. Many days your mother fasted before your birth, and now this demented old man is about to sacrifice you. Isaac replied, even so, I will not disregard the will of my creator nor the command of my father. He turned to his father and said, father, do you hear what this man has told me? And he replied, pay no heed to him. He has come only to torment us. Forthwith, and Isaac spoke. Okay, so now Satan is trying to, to get Isaac out of the deal, okay? What did Satan do then, Satan? He said to Avraham, now a word was secretly brought to me, something from Job, okay? That is, I have heard from behind the heavenly curtain that a lamb will be sacrificed as a burnt offering instead of Isaac. And Abraham responded, it is a liar's fate that even though he should speak the truth, no one will believe him. So he doesn't even know, right? Satan is speaking the truth, but Avraham's not going to listen. Um, it, it, is, it is 11 o'clock. If anyone needs to or wants to go, feel free. Um, is it okay if I continue through the rest of these? Okay, if anyone wants to stick around for a little longer, um, let's look at Isaac's feelings, okay? Um, he took the wood and placed it on the back of his son Isaac, and he took the fire and the knife in his hand, and they both went, and they went both of them together. Isaac said to his father, Oh, my father, behold, the fire and the wood, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? He replied to him, My son, thou art the lamb for the burnt offering. As it is said, and Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb. So here, Abraham's just telling him, you're the lamb. Sorry, dude. Um, and so then uh, immediately an overpowering fear and violent trembling seized Isaac. For when he saw nothing to be sacrificed, he realized what was about to transpire. And yet he asked once again, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham responded, since you ask, the Holy One, blessed be he, has selected you. If he has chosen me, Isaac replied, I shall willingly surrender my soul to him, but I am gravely concerned about my mother. Nevertheless, they went both of them together of one mind, convinced that one was to slaughter and the other to be slaughtered. So they were both okay with this now. Isaac was 37 at the time of his binding. Let's remember where that math comes from. Uh, Susan, you're, you're raising your hand. Okay, oh, no, no, I, I was, no, Rabbi, I, 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 I'm familiar with the math. That, yeah. I'm familiar with the fact that, that there is some evidence that he's uh, middle-aged, I guess, for lack of a better expression. Sure. It, it, I was actually going to raise, raise my hand for another question, but I don't want to stop your train of thought. Okay, hang on. I'll come right back to you. Um, leave your hand up. I just want to do the math. Um, we know that Isaac was born when Sarah was 90. Okay. And again, we're not always sure of the chronology in the text. Right after Genesis 22, when the Akedah takes place, if you go to 23, the very next text, she dies. She dies immediately following the events of the Akedah. And we don't know if they're connected or not. It was 127. Okay. So the rabbi said, um, what if she died as a result of this almost sacrifice of her son? And her age here is 127. So they, they assume then that if this followed immediately, he must, Isaac must be 20, uh, 37. Does that make sense? Yes. She was 90, and now she's dying at 127, that Isaac must be 
37 at the time of the Akedah. So he's not a little kid. He's a grown adult who's along for the walk and along for the sacrifice. So, Mayor. But early on, they said he was three. Yes, there's a lot of disagreement about how old he is. <laughs> okay, and here's my theory that I have discussed with my rabbi since I'm a kid. The Hebrew calendar, the beginning of the year is really Passover, April-ish. Yep. And then it says that we should have the new year, Rosh Hashanah, in September, October, Tishrei. I'm thinking they did two years for every one of ours. So the miracle of Abraham being 50, 100, maybe he was really 50. And maybe she wasn't 90, maybe she was 45. It's just my thought. It's a very interesting theory. That's as valid a midrash as any other. <laughs> there you go. Um, you know, uh, there's no reason it couldn't be that that, that was how it was. Um, we know that that's not really that... that and Tishrei is considered to be the seventh month, and we're supposed to celebrate right the first day of the seventh month. But you know, you you that's totally valid. So, Mayor, let's come back to you. I, I thought on that point we had five New Years during the calendar year. Yes, there are five. So, um, with regards to the point I was going to make, Rabbi, if you would permit me to be um, hitchhike on your point about uh, Sarah's death, um, the Akedah could be a transition point. In the sense that uh, Abraham, at least I, I learned, Abraham never speaks to God again. And uh, he, he needs to back out of the story. And now it's Isaac's turn. That's, that's a great point. So there's three moving parts here in terms of uh, Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, their generation is going to finish off. Exactly. It's the, it's the first, you know, it's the opening of, uh, or the end of Genesis in a way. It's so, a precursor. Transition. Right. right. We need to get rid of all the old timers. Mm. Well, at least the first, the first generation. First generation. David, please, quickly, if you don't mind. So, so following on, on Michael's observation, it would seem to me that the difficulty here is not, um, do we make a transition from first generation, second, but how do we impress on the second generation the importance of being in a covenant with God? So Isaac grows up in relative wealth. Um, you know, his older brother gets kicked out of camp and all of a sudden, you know, he's left. You're perhaps a spoiled kid, I don't know. Um, but how do we impress upon him with, without actually killing him? <laughs> that this is, this is a really serious covenant that you have with, with this God, right? This is not a pagan God. This is not a God of revelry. It's not Dionysian. It's not all these things that all these other cultures around us do. This is everything. Yep. This is, this is, there is an immensity to this relationship. And how would you impress that on him? Just by telling him? So, you know, what does Isaac see in his father's face? Yeah. I mean, if nothing else, he has to see kind of the imprint of the direness of the moment. Mm. And it doesn't say so, but it doesn't, you don't have to dig very deep into the text to see that that's what's going on. And we know that Isaac goes blind later. And so, you know, one of the questions is what caused that blindness? Yeah. Uh, one of the, one of the Midrashim, which I don't believe I included here, says that the angels cried with what was happening and they were so scared and their tears blinded him so that he didn't see the knife held above his head of his, his father about to kill him. Um, and that's why he went blind later. Um, so the next one, again, what does Isaac think about this? Okay. This one says he was fear. He was, he was afraid. He was trembling. Okay. Um, and, and then he eventually gets, um, he eventually comes along and says, I'm just worried about my mom. This one says, as Abraham was about to slaughter him, this one haunts me. Okay. Isaac cried out, father, bind my hands and feet 
for the will to live is strong within me. And when I see the knife descending, I may tremble and the offering may become defective as a result of the knife slipping. I implore you not to make me a blemished offering. Isaac said to him, Father, do not tell my mother about this when she is standing at the edge of a pit or a roof, lest she hurl herself down and die. After they had constructed the altar, Abraham bound Isaac upon it and took the knife in hand to slaughter him until a fourth of the measure of blood would flow from his body. Satan appeared and pushed Abraham's hand, causing the knife to fall. As he reached out to grasp the knife again, finally, a voice called out and said, lay not thy hand upon the lad. If this had not happened, Isaac would certainly have been sacrificed. Satan appeared. Okay, so a fourth of his blood was already drained from him. Um, then you have Satan again interfering. While all of this was transpiring, Satan visited Sarah in the guise. Oh, thank you, Rick. Good yon, Tiff. Um, in the guise of Isaac. When she saw him, she asked, what did, what did your father do to you, my son? He replied, my father led me over mountains and through valleys until we reached the top of a certain mountain. There he erected an altar, arranged the firewood, bound me upon the altar, and took a knife to slaughter me. If the Holy One, blessed be he, had not called out, lay not thy hand upon the lad, I would have been slaughtered. He could hardly complete relating what had transpired when she fainted and died. As it is written, and Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And from where did he come? from Moriah. So this is one of the texts linking the Akedah directly to her death. Okay. Um, then there are a few that then start to link the Akedah to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and why we read it. So I just want to point out, um, Abraham says, you told me that I was going to become a really numerous people and that Isaac was going to be the one through whom we became as numerous as the stars. And that's not been what happened. Uh, I did, I restrained myself and did not challenge you. Therefore, so here's now Abraham calling the shots. When Isaac's descendants sin and are being oppressed, recall the binding of Isaac, reckon it as if his ashes were piled upon the altar and pardon them and release them from their anguish. So because I did this, you better let all of our descendants off the hook when they sin. Um, which gets a little close to Jesus died for your sins, okay? But it's our version of it not having to be completed. Um, and then you have here, you have spoken what was in your heart. Now I will say what I wish to say. So God responds. In the future, Isaac's descendants will sin against me and I will judge them on Rosh Hashanah. If they want me to discover something for their credit and to recall for their advantage the binding of Isaac, let them blow upon this shofar. Abraham asked, what shofar? The Holy One, blessed be he, said, turn around. And then Abraham sees the ram. And this was one of the 10 things that was created when? At twilight on the sixth day, right? There's the ram. And that's where the shofar is going to come from, from that ram, okay? I propose there are three victims of the Akedah. One of them says Isaac was resurrected that he did actually die momentarily. Rabbi Yehuda said, when the blade touched his neck, the soul of Isaac fled and departed. Okay, he died. <clears throat> but when he heard his voice from between the two cherubim, God's voice, saying to Abraham, lay not thine hand upon thy lad, his soul returned to his body. And Abraham set, his, has set him free and Isaac stood up on his feet. And Isaac knew that in this matter, the dead in the future will be quickened. So, you know, it's lucky that he was able to come back. He opened his mouth and said, Blessed art thou, O Lord, who quickened the dead. Who brought back, oh, I'm sorry, quickened, meaning they'll be resurrected. Um, blessed are you, Adonai, who resurrects the dead. Isaac was resurrected. <gasps> There's a theory that he actually killed him. Then you have the ram, okay, and that Semael was involved with uh, being with putting the ram out. Um, I'm going to skip that one and just go to Sarah one last time uh, about the shofar because this is the last text. When Abraham returned from Mount Moriah in peace, the anger of Samael, which is another name for Satan, 
okay the one of the evil um angels uh a demon actually um the anger of Samael was kindled, for he saw that the desire of his heart to frustrate the offering of our father Abraham had not been realized. What did he do? He went and said to Sarah, Hast thou not heard what has happened in the world? She said to him, No. And he said to her, Right, um, Thy husband Abraham has taken thy son Isaac and slain him and offered him up as a burnt offering upon the altar. So Satan, Samael says he's actually been killed. Um, she begins. She began to weep and to cry aloud three times, corresponding to the three sustained notes of the shofar. Do, ooh, ooh, ooh. And she gave forth three howlings, corresponding to the three disconnected short notes do, 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 of the shofar. And her soul fled, and she died. So. <laughs> The rabbis have struggled with this. Um, I, if anything, uh, there isn't a nechemta other than to say, a nechemta meaning words of comfort, other than to say the rabbis of old, for the most part, were just as uncomfortable with and um, struggled as much with this text. And so when we read it on Rosh Hashanah and we say, why is this here? How could there be such a story? You see that it's something that we have we have always as as human beings, even though it's in our Torah, have wrestled with. So, David, what would you like to? So, say? sometime about an hour ago, somebody asked, "Why would these rabbis come up with all this midrash? And why would it not be in the Torah? Why would it not be in the Torah?" Right. Right. Melanie. So, would you? so I have a thought on that actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, the particular contents of these these ruminations, you know, kind of a, a historian of, of, of intellect and literature could say, well, in this century, this was on people's mind, in this century. Sure. That's not what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. So my grandfather, who was a student at one of Europe's great yeshivas back before World War I, um, was an avid chess player. And also a very, very good chess player. Mm -hmm. He did actually once, for those of you who are familiar, in the park behind the public library in New York, there's a chess club and, you know, occasionally the grandmasters will come down and like play everybody in the club on like a 15 different board, okay? Um, so my grandfather participated in one of these where um, Emmanuel Lasker, who was the world champion at that time, played like, you know, 15 of these, these mostly Jewish guys in the park, and my grandfather beat him. Um, you know, wouldn't have beat him in a tournament, but that's a different story. So when I was a kid, he taught me how to play when I was about six. And of course, you know, that's like swatting a fly. But by the time I was 11 or 12, I could occasionally, you know, make some arrangements of the board that would actually make him think. Where, you know, now he had... He had a configuration on the board, so to speak. Go we'll sacrifice your son. There's, there is the board that's given to you. You got to think about it. And he would have a conversation with his queen. Every time he would talk with his queen in Yiddish. And he'd start asking her, well, what do you think? And the queen would say, ah, oh, bring up the horses. And he'd say, no, they're, they're happy in their stable. And he'd go, through, he'd go through each of these permutations with the knights and the bishops and the what if I just move the pawns and we, we shift it a little bit, bit, and there's stories with each one, okay? So, and eventually he'd make us move and destroy them. But I asked him once, why don't you talk with the king? And he said, no, 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 can't talk with the king. He's much too powerful. Who knows what he could say? It could really be dangerous. <laughs> And I'm thinking, why isn't it in Torah? Because that's like talking with the king. Yeah. The Midrash is talking with the queen. You go through every possible move, every possible story. And then you decide what to do. Mm. <coughs> what a nice analogy. Thank you. Yeah. That's really great. Um, and do we challenge God in these Midrashim? Sometimes, but usually no. You're right. But not to his face. Um, you do it through the queen. Right. 
or through Rabbi so and so. Yep. So, everyone, Yashir Koach, thank for thank you for being with us and for helping us study some of these texts and wrestle, which is so much fun. It is our as Yisrael God wrestlers. It is our heritage it is our mandate to wrestle with these texts and if you enjoyed this you are those of you who aren't regulars at scrollers on saturday mornings you are always always invited um there's always a place for everyone around the um virtual table or real table um still virtual and uh we would love to have you because